write it and they will come. Uh, first, I want to say thank you for coming today. And I know it's raining and I know it's hot and I'm so happy that you all are here. I'm so happy the room is full. Part of me just wants to go sit there over here and I can just like look at the room and take it all in because it's fabulous. And I'm seeing all different kinds of people here. And actually, that's really exciting for me as well. A uh, couple of things I want to say. I want to first of all thank the festival um, producers, people who put this together to invite me. It's the first time I've been at the Decatur Book Festival as well. It's fabulous, but I'm not going to have any money left in my wallet when I go home. <laughs> I'm having a wonderful time. I appreciate that. Um, the other thing I want to say, this is kind of perfect for me. This is the first book, yes, <laughs> that I've written. Uh, and it's perfect for me to come back here and do this talk because actually in 2005, I lived here for one year, and that's when I was doing this book as research for a dissertation, and I wrote it, the first draft, here in Atlanta. So it's really kind of nice for me to come back here and sort of have that moment. Um, thank you, Atlanta, because that was hard. Um, yeah, okay, black faces, white spaces. So a couple of things I want to do, but I want to make sure there's time for questions. So I just want to make sure my time is right, because this is one of my favorite topics, and I can go on. So how, where's my, how long do I go on for? How much time do they have for questions? How does it work? Well, we'll let you know if you've got five minutes to go. If that's, if that's yeah, that's, right. please let me know. Go like, five minutes on and then five minutes, to, and then how long is that? 6.15. Okay, but then there'll be time for questions. No, that's what, I want, that's what I'm trying to understand. Yes, let me know what I want. How much time do we have? No. 15 minutes before. I want, to, I want there to be at least 15 minutes, 20 minutes for questions. Okay. Yeah. But when it's 6 o'clock, you've got 15 minutes. Beautiful thing. All right. Black faces, white spaces. So why did I write this book? That for me is always the most important question. And as somebody who works in academia, I find that often people want to know what I have in my head about this, right? What's intellectual about this. And yeah, that was part of it. But actually, that is not why I wrote this book. That's not why I was motivated to tell this story at all. It is really personal for me. You know, so sometimes when I'm standing in front of the room, the first thing I like to say is, yes, I'm black. <laughs> <laughs> because I'm about to talk to you about black faces, white spaces. And yes, I have biases. I have a point of view about this. I stand in this. When I wrote this book about other people, I was also writing this about myself. And so I have to be really honest about that. And I, have a certain, I take a certain pride in that as well. So I've got to tell you a little bit of the story of who I am. There's a couple of you in this room who've heard me tell that story before, but I can't ever start talking about this book without telling my own story. And part of that is because I believe that all knowledge is subjective, meaning that everything that we all know, we bring ourselves to that. You know, some people will challenge me on that because some people believe knowledge is objective, that we can kind of stand apart from it. What I know about myself is I cannot. And so I have to tell you a little bit about myself and where I grew up. So, Mm, mouth is dry already. Okay. Um, both pictures are there. So I was born in New York. You know, it's really funny, people who know me. I was a geographer, why I do, why we do, what we do, where we do it. It's all, it's all, all, it's all about place, people, and place, and the relationship between both. So where I stand, the land on which I stand on, is really important for me. Um, I've lived all over the place. I presently live in Northern Cal, and so California, and I've lived there for about seven years. But when people ever ask me, they say, where are you from? And I always go, do you want to know where I live or where I'm from? <laughs> and then I say, because I'm from New York, and I will always be from New York. I once said that to an old dude in Chicago not that long ago. And I, and I said the same thing, just I gave him a look just like you, and he just looked at me and said, oh, you must be from New York. <laughs> So I was born in New York. My parents, this is a picture from them, thank you for the water. It's a picture from them, uh, of them from about 1957. They're still with us. Uh, my parents are from a small town in Virginia, Floyd, Virginia, Roanoke. They grew up there in the 30s, 40s, and 50s during Jim Crow segregation. Both of them have a high school education. My dad went off to the Korean War. When he got back in the late 50s, he had to find a job. And like a lot of black folks at the time who lived in the South, he decided they were gonna, they were gonna move north because they thought they'd have a better opportunity. So they moved up to New York, because my dad had a sister there who was a nurse. Uh, and he got two job offers. One was he could be a janitor in Syracuse, New York, which is about five hours north of New York City. And the other was about half an hour outside of New York City, there was an estate owned by a very wealthy Jewish family. Um, if any of you have ever heard of the Tishmans, if you know New York City, the Tishmans have their own building. They own a lot of real estate there. The Tishmans also have a 12-acre estate, estate right outside of New York City, and that's the picture you're seeing there. And they needed a gardener. They needed a gardener, they needed a chauffeur, they needed a sometime housekeeper, and my parents took that job. My parents did that job for 50 years. We lived on that land, right? So this 
picture in the corner is actually the gardener's cottage where I live. That's the gardener's cottage. The picture I don't have in there is what I like to call the big house. <laughs> that the Tishmans came up to on weekends and holidays. And because the Tishmans would come up on weekends and holidays, it meant that actually my family, we had run to that place during the week. Now, my parents thought they couldn't have kids, so they adopted me. And then two years later, I had my first brother, and a few years after that, the second brother. <laughs> <laughs> so I had me and my brother, so we had run to the place. It was like being on your own little park, 12 acres. There was a small pond that had fish and snapping turtles and wild birds. There was a swimming pool there, multiple gardens, which you can't see. This driveway kind of loops around. It was very private. Um, um, the houses are set off the street. Very, very wealthy white neighborhood. Harry Winston has property down the street. Wingfoot Golf Club is around the corner. Schaefer of Schaefer Beer lived next door. Schaefer Beer isn't very good. But anyway, they had a lot of money and then they next door. Um, I, there's so many stories I like to tell to give a sense of myself, and one of them I tell over and over again, because for, for me it's the most, uh, the one that's the most vivid in my head of when probably as a kid I kind of started thinking about the color of my skin in relation to the place where I was living and what that meant from people looking outside in at me. And so I tell the story when I was nine years old. And you have to picture me at nine, a little afro, I had reading glasses. I was coming home from school one day and there was always cops patrolling the neighborhood because it is a wealthy neighborhood. And a cop stopped me, I was right around the corner from the house and he wanted to know where I was going. And I said, a thousand old White Plains Road, that's the address. And he just looked at me and said, oh, do you work there? And I'm thinking I'm nine years old. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm not saying that. Uh, and I remember going home and telling my parents that. And I remember my father getting really upset and calling the police station and giving him holy hell because of it. Um, he thinks he's the most radical black man in America. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I think that was the first moment that being black in my family, that was an issue that I knew about within our family and how that was held, particularly in the 60s. But I think it was the first time I thought, oh, it's not really right or natural for me to live in a really nice place, or my family, with nice trees and wildlife and um, beautiful um, grounds to be on. It was, it was abnormal somehow. And I also have to throw this in here, which I don't always do. It wasn't, it's really easy, particularly when talking about black and white, to say that it was, oh, it was the white people doing X, Y, and Z. What I want to also say from the time I was in fourth grade right up into high school, but particularly fourth grade through sixth and seventh grade, I got beat up on a daily basis, but not by the white kids. It was by the black kids um, who didn't live up on the hill. Marion Mitchell and Darling Robinson. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> Now, don't you wish that you could see these people again? Um, what I would say. The thing is, what I wasn't able to say then, I was nine, I was 10. How do you have a conversation? They thought I thought I was better than them because we lived up on the hill. They lived in the working class section of Ameranek. And what, who did I think that I was? Who did I think that I was with the clothes that I was wearing? Often clothes that I got from the Tishmans because they would give them as gifts at Christmas. And so they would often take some of the clothes that I'd be wearing. It was a whole saga. My parents threatened to send me to Catholic school because my grades went down. We weren't even Catholic. It's a whole story. <laughs> um, but this is where the complexity, the compli how complicated it was. What did it mean for my family, the only family of color to live, not just black family, the only family of color to live on that hill? To this day, there are still no other people of color. A Japanese American woman lived there for a number of years. She is now gone. Um, so I'm going to come back to the story at the end, because so, there's more to that story. So I have. This is what drives me when I think about my parents, when I think about my parents living on this piece of land. They don't live on this piece of land anymore. And then I start thinking about how my parents would never call themselves environmentalists. They would never say that's what I am. They don't even, I don't even think they have a full understanding of what that actually means. What I do know is that day in and day out for 50 years, my parents cared for this piece of land. They worked hard, they loved it, they hated it. They knew it better than the owners, and I started thinking about all the people in this country who have done that, work the land, day in, day out. They care for it, they love it. They often love it more than the owners who have a deed and have money, and I'm not putting people who have that privilege down, I'm just saying. And they're often invisible in the larger story. And so I actually really, this was personal, I wanted my parents, I want them to be in the story when we talk about the environment in this country, when we think about environmental movement and for me, help for me, that really has to be expanded in terms of who we're talking about and who we're engaging. Because I always ask the question, who is being left out? My parents are left out. And there's a whole lot of other people in the history of this country that are left out.
story a lot of different ways, and I think how I want to do it today is just kind of take each chapter and tell a little bit from them, and then kind of see how I go off on it a little bit. So some of the, ch the, the chapter titles I use, are, are, I borrow them from Spike Lee movies, and I do it very particularly, because I really, also in telling this story, you know, I'm in academia, I never call myself an academic. That's a whole other story. <laughs> uh, and I really wanted it to be, I wanted to treat equally the stories that I found in the library books and the academic journals with the stories that people were telling me about their lives and the stories that I found in the newspapers and the stories from diaries and the stories from memory, anecdote. And so for me, it also meant borrowing from popular culture and understanding that we have storytellers about black life in this country who are incredibly powerful. And I sort of wanted to pull on that. There was a lot of pushback on me in academia for doing that. That's also another story, but I want to put that out there. But I can speak for the collective we because I can't. But I was thinking about, because I have an opinion, about how I think we have been bamboozled about what the environmental story is of this country. We have been bamboozled because a lot of people have been left out. So I love movies. And I decided to rewatch the movie Far and Away with Tom Cruise and Nicole Kidman. You're probably like, what does that have to do with anything? I'm going to tell you. <laughs> I watched that movie, mostly not because of Tom Cruise and Nicole Kidman so much, but the last 20 minutes of the movie for me is incredibly powerful because it actually gives you some idea of what the Homestead Act, what it must have looked like in 1862 when European immigrants came over here and the government said, you know, okay, here's what we're going to do. The gun's going to go off at midnight. You can run out. You can put your stake down. You can get 100 acres just like that. It's yours for free. All you have to do is stay on it for five years. You stay on it for five years. You build a house. You farm. You manage to survive that. And after five years, it's free and clear. It is yours. You own it. That's incredible to me. That's incredible to think about. We can't do anything like that anymore, anywhere. That's all. And people die trying to do it. People fought each other for trying to do it. And that is hard ass work, excuse my French, because it's isolating work. I can only imagine what it must have been like for many of those immigrants who came over and got that piece of land and stayed on it and died, because they were 100 miles from their nearest neighbor, what that must have been like. So I take nothing away from that. I love watching that scene, because I'm watching people in wagons and horses and running, trying to get their piece of land, the best, what they thought was the best piece of land for themselves. And then I thought about who lived on that piece of land before they got there. <laughs> right, and who had to be moved? Don't start talking to me about the Trail of Tears and all the American Indians who had to be removed, who died from that land that they lived on. And then I started thinking about, you know, in 1865, when uh, enslaved Africans were freed, were given 400,000 acres, and then had it all taken away because a lot of white plantation owners got, got scared. I mean, and, you know, I have some small, small, small amount of empathy and understanding for that because they understood that land is political power, it's economic power. Holy crap, what's gonna happen if we give 400,000 acres to people that we've enslaved? What's gonna happen? All that land was taken away. Some of those people said, um, there were some people in Congress who said, well, hey, why don't we let them participate in the Homestead Act? But other people shot it down. So they were not allowed to participate. This is all happening at the exact same time. European immigrants are running out, getting free plots of land to grow, make their own, do what it is they want. American Indians are removed from their land and being put on the least worst land. And enslaved Africans are being told, you can't have any land at all. Forget it. OK, this is where we began as a country. And it's hard for us to stand in it, but it's the truth of it. And when I start thinking about the environmental movement, I start to see where it starts to disconnect for different groups of people, just the legacy of that over time. Not just about economic power and political power, but also the power of belonging, just what it means to feel like you belong somewhere, right? And this country is trying to build an image of itself, say who it is and what it is as a country. What does that mean? I'm looking at the time going, oh, no, they're not getting out, lock the doors now. <laughs> Second uh, chapter is Jungle Fever. And I always put up these two images. Right? I start off with images. So images for me are really, really important. We often think of images as being somewhat benign. But think about how powerful an image is. You don't even need any words. And I know there's a lot of writers in the room, and I'm not dissing words at all. But just the image. So LeBron James was the first African-American man ever to be on the cover of Vogue magazine with Giselle Bündchen, the model. And a lot of black folks went crazy when they saw this image because this is from 1917, right down to the color of her dress. 
And the reason why so many black people, including myself, got upset is because there is a history in this country of black and brown people being associated with the primitive. This idea of being primitive and being natural is not the thing that some of us think it is now. Like we take pride, we're like, yeah, I'm back to nature. You know, black people in this country have been told we've always been closer to, therefore are less evolved and aren't as close to God as white people are. What's interesting for me about the people in Vogue magazine, they were showing this and they said they didn't know anything about it. And for me, that just can't be true. I'm sorry, that just can't be true. But even if it is, that's not an excuse. Because that says something about the, their consciousness and lack of awareness about this. So I'm, in, I'm interested in that. Also in this chapter, I talk about in 1964, we had another two of our most powerful pieces of legislation take place. The Wilderness Act and the Civil Rights Act in the same year. But these two groups of people never talk to each other. The work that both these groups of people were doing were very important, but if you look closely at the wording, it's really interesting to me in the Wilderson Act that talks about the primitive and keeping places this way and that they're open for all people. In 1964, if you were black, how many places in this country could you go to safely? Right? It's so interesting to me. So I'm not dissing Xanites or any of the men who sat down to write the Wilderness Act. I think it's incredibly powerful and thoughtful and deep and disconnected from the reality of a whole lot of other people. And I want to say that within the Civil Rights Act, and they had the things that they were focused on. Thank God. Thank God for me. I wouldn't be standing up here as I am right now if it wasn't for the Civil Rights Act. And also not really talking about the environment either, giving the environment, nature, it's just due. Because we all need it to survive. I don't care what color our skin is, right? Oh, I'm getting worked up now. <laughs> the other thing I want to say about uh, jungle fever is let me just say this first. Uh, so one of the things I talk